Welcome everybody to School Psych Podcast. So happy to have you with us tonight. Uh, we've got a fabulous guest and I think we're in for a great conversation. Uh, I wanted to also check in with everybody about how we're all doing before winter break is approaching. And, um, and some of you might be on winter break already, but I know that in my area, the county next door has closed down due to COVID spikes. And we are looking of a, a similar nature, but my county has not... Um, has not gone virtual at this point. And so there's lots of talk back and forth. So if anybody um, has a, a district that's closed down or there's talk of closing down, we definitely wanna hear from you in the chat and let us know maybe what state you're in and how things are, are going for everybody. Hope that everybody's staying uh, safe and healthy. But my name is Rachel, I'm a school psychologist. I'm in Maryland and I'm gonna pass it over to Rebecca who's gonna tell everybody how to participate tonight. Rebecca. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight and listening later in the future also. Um, if you are watching us live or tuning in live, you can comment right alongside the YouTube video by signing into a YouTube account. And you can also, if you'd like to, message us more privately on Facebook, on either of the Facebook pages, the School Psych Podcast page, or School Psych, Your School Psychologist. And you can also tweet to us or at us on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. And our podcast handle is at Podcast Psyched. So we'll be looking for, I'll be looking for notifications and comments and questions and hopefully uh, hoping that you will join in on the on the conversation. Um, I also wanted to just quickly introduce myself. I'm Rebecca, I'm a school psychologist in the state of Connecticut and say that we are similarly getting a little bit concerned again about um, increasing COVID numbers, but the governor of Connecticut has talked about a test and stay model. So kids are able to um, have um, ha test out of long quarantines and um, be able to stay in school. So we've been in school in person with masks and um, I personally, my school's on break now until January 3rd, but I'm hoping, you know, that all goes well. So we're look, thinking of everybody out there in their schools and hoping everyone stays safe in school, learning, thriving, and healthy. And I'm gonna pass it off to Eric, who's gonna introduce our wonderful guest. Hi everyone, I'm Eric, and I'm also a school psychologist in Connecticut. And we are excited to have Dr. Richard Nisbet with us. He is one of the world's most respected psychologists. His work focuses on issues in social psychology as well as cognitive psychology. He has written a number of books and articles, uh, one of which articles, uh, his articles is one of the most cited uh, psychology articles in the world. He's received a number of awards, uh, one being the Distinguished Scientific Contributions from the American Psychological Association and many national and international awards. He's the member, a member of the Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences sciences and as a recipient of the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. His book, The Geography of Thought, How Asians and Westerners Think Differently and Why, won the William James Award uh, through the American Psychological Association. And he's written a number of books on cognition, um, thinking, uh, how we can develop better logical and uh, thinking skills and some errors that we might have in our logic and thinking. And his newest book is called Thinking a Memoir. So welcome, Dr. Nisbet. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I'm wondering if you could uh, start off maybe talking about your newest book, uh, your memoir, and uh, perhaps what inspired that. Well, uh, I wanted to have um, an account of the kind of work that uh, my students and I have been doing on thinking and reasoning and inference and intelligence uh, and styles of thought, cultural differences in styles of thought. Uh, it's all sort of related except for one thing, which probably isn't relevant for us to talk about, the question of culture of honor, but which is the only exception. Everything else is about thinking and reasoning. So I thought I'd put that in a place where people don't have to have any kind of professional experience with any of this uh, kind of thing in order to be able to understand what it's about. Uh, and I thought I'd just write about my early life because it's somewhat unusual. As we were just talking about before uh, the, the show started, um, one thing that was extremely distinctive about 
my childhood is how completely free of constraint it was. I wandered around <clears throat> all over um, West El Paso and uh, the Rio Grande uh, from the time I was six years old. Uh, I was allowed to ride a bus for 30 minutes um, to go to town to see a movie and do lots of other things that my parents didn't know I was doing, like playing pinball. Uh, and uh, I asked my mother, actually, uh, not long before she died, I said, because I had kids and I, I wasn't, would not have let my kids have that kind of freedom. And I said, why did you let me do it? And she said, it's because we never heard of anything bad happening. So the press is great, except that it's put a lot of kids in jail. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, we overestimate the risk so enormously. Uh, and, you know, I can say that, but I have little kids and I protected them more than I know they really needed protection, but you just, you just do. And some people are truly, truly crazy. I mean, so at any rate, there were many other aspects of my childhood that were interesting and that fed into the work I did. And I thought it was interesting to show that, that things that happen to you early in life can have an impact on uh, the nature of research you do if you're a scientist. I love that. And I think um, the, the in issue of culture has come up in your research and your work and cultural influences on cognition and certainly um, growing up in uh, an area where you were uh, close to another country. Um, so I, I wonder, maybe this is a good segue to talk a little bit about culture um, and influences on, on cognition. Fine, good. Um, so you have, uh, I guess I'll ask a, a little bit about the culture of, of your growing up, um, perhaps on, on, you know, that West Texas area and, um, where there's a blend, uh, I'm, I'm not from there, but I'm assuming a, a large blend of folks from Mexican, uh, heritage right. as well. Um, right. and then you've also written about, uh, Asian cultures. So I, I'm wondering, um, just about what are your thoughts about cultural influence on cognition and, um, and perhaps some of the differences you've seen in, um, in specific cultures? Right. Well, you know, I, an interesting fact about my research on culture and reasoning is that I was confident when I started the work that uh, the way people think it's all the same. I mean, it's universal. I, I was a complete universalist. And I went to China uh, to give lectures at uh, Peking University uh, in uh, 1982. Uh, and I did a lot of reading about Chinese thought and history and so on, the nature of Chinese society, uh, because it, I wanted to be somewhat up to snuff when I got there. And it was a good thing I did. I mean, I learned a lot, but I did not learn that they thought differently from us. In fact, I was kind of lulled into thinking, you know, there's not going to be psychological differences there. And it's because uh, I would spent time with a lot of different people. Um, and I felt that they were, I felt like I was completely understanding them. I mean, there was absolutely no problem. Of course, it was all because they knew English, not because I knew Chinese. Uh, but I felt like if you think of the, all of the people you know best, um, how distributed they are in personality dimensions, how, you know, how, uh, how warm, how quick to temper, uh, how interesting, et cetera. I felt these Chinese people were as distributed in personality space as any comparable number of Americans. So I was kind of, it really enhanced my uh, universalism. But there was a student there uh, who hardly could speak English, but he came to talk to me several times. And it was perfectly clear that the guy was absolutely brilliant, uh, despite the fact that his language was so limited. Uh, and a few years later, he came to work with me, um, and uh, his name was Kaiping Peng. Uh, 
And after we'd been working together for a while, he said, you know, Dick, you and I think quite differently uh, about a lot of things. And I said, oh, really? Tell me more. Uh, and he then gave me a version, a shorthand version of the following, which is what our research ended up establishing. <clears throat> he said, you uh, look at some object or some person or some idea or situation and you try to catalog its attributes, try to figure out what, what, it, what it's like. You figure out the rules that uh, you can use to understand the behavior of the object or person. And uh, you kind of make a mental model uh, and uh, you use that mental model to control uh, your interactions with this person and try to produce good outcomes uh, for yourself. Said he, on the other hand, doesn't pay so much attention to attributes and categorization and rules about the object. He's much more concerned with looking at the object in its context. And we ended up calling that holistic reasoning because in effect, he's paying attention to a lot more things uh, than I'm paying attention to. Uh, and he's seeing the causes of my behavior in the context I'm in. Whereas I see my own behavior and the behavior of others as being produced sort of internally. It's just sort of a manifestation instead of a response. Now, he was not all that articulate. <laughs> it took us 10 years to get to the point of being able to say that, that, that uh, concretely. But to give you some ideas about how different of uh, the type of reasoning is. Well, first we can start with perception, which isn't the first thing we did, but these differences in cognition go all the way down to perception. Uh, and one of our studies, we showed people underwater scenes uh, and we asked them to tell us, for, lasted 20 seconds, and then we asked them to tell us what they had seen. Americans will say, well, I saw three big fish They had fins on their backs and speckles on their bellies and so on. Uh, it's extremely unusual for an East Asian, by which I mean Japanese, Korean, Chinese, etc. Um, it's very unusual for them to start like that. Instead, they want to tell you about the context. So they say, well, I saw what looked like a stream. The water was green. There were rocks and shells on the bottom. There were three big fish swimming off to the left. Okay. Um, and so they start with context. We start with the central object. We tell you the attributes of that, of that object while we're categorizing it, thinking about the rules that pertain to it. They're seeing its relationships uh, to the rest of its environment. They're seeing similarities and differences. They're attending to those things, which is not so important to us. When you put a device on people's uh, heads, which will show you where they're looking at every minute, <clears throat> at a still picture, uh, the American subjects are just looking everything at all kinds of things about that object, looking it up and down, uh, and just maybe every now and then a little look off to the, to the background or the context. The East Asian subjects look back and forth between the object and the context. And what after they've done that, what they literally, the memory they have is not just of the object, which tends to be everything that the American would get, but of the object in its context. That's, that's what they remember. Um, so uh, there are differences in logical reasoning versus uh, what uh, Kaiping called um, um, uh, 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 reasoning that's much more uh, relational uh, and holistic. Um, amazingly, the Chinese, although they were ahead, it's the ancient Chinese, although they, they, were, they were ahead of the West, Let's focus on Greece because that's the, the most advanced European civilization uh, 
if 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, they were technologically much more advanced than the Greeks. But the Greeks uh, invented science and the Chinese never did. And if you think about it, science just is categories and rules. That's what they're doing. They're categorizing things and find out the rules that pertain to them. It's a habit of mind that was common to the, uh, to the Greeks and it makes sense that they would have invented uh, science. The holistic orientation that's always been characteristic of East Asians uh, led them to understand the concept of action at a distance. Um, so they realized um, how to understand uh, auditory uh, phenomena, uh, magnetism, and they understood the real reason for the tides, which escaped even Galileo. Uh, wasn't until the late 18th century that uh, Westerners came to understand, yes, there is such a thing as action and distance and gravity is the way to understand a lot of those things. Um, but logic was never uh, very important. In fact, to, even today, it was, it was never formalized. There was no interest in it. It was never formalized. It still is very little interest in it in the East. And if you reason too logically, you insist on being too logical, they consider that uh, childish. Uh, they always want to think about things in their proper context. <clears throat> so these are some of the differences and they're, they're very large and they're very consequential. So. That is so interesting. Um, and that kind of reminds me, I am not going to be able to cite it, but I, I read something recently about the differences in kind of American thinking and European thinking in, in regards to um, roadway construction, that here in America, if there's an accident, um, there's always, there's somebody at fault. You know, somebody made a poor decision, somebody was reckless, somebody, you know, was going too fast, that type of thing. Whereas um, this article claimed that those in Europe, that, that's not always, it's not always focused on the individual. It's what was wrong with the roadway? How can we make this roadway safer? Um, you know, is the speed limit too high? Is the curve too, too sharp, you know, type of things. And that as a consequence of that, that their highways and roadways are much safer because they think a little bit more outside of, you know, individual responsibility being uh, such a big thing as what, you know, we, we tend to value here in American culture. That's a wonderful example. Uh, I, I would never have thought of it. And Europeans, I mean, basically the continuum here has, as you might guess, Americans at one end and I'd say Japanese at the other. And as you move west from Japan, uh, people are shifted more and more toward a more analytic and a less uh, uh, holistic way of thinking. Um, so that uh, actually Russians are closer to Chinese and to the extent that we've looked at it, we're gonna have a tremendous amount of research on Russia, but they're really more like the Chinese than they are like the rest of the Europeans. And the, the Germans invented dialectical thinking. They were so concerned with, you know, there's a, there's a proposition and then there's an opposing proposition and then you, uh, you try to find out which one is right, or you try to find out how, how they could both be correct, even though they seem to be opposites. Uh, that was never a customary way of thinking for Anglo-Saxons at all. Uh, and so it is a kind of continuum, an east-west uh, continuum. But that's a wonderful European example. And so as school psychologists, um, you know, we give, we give IQ tests a lot. Now, I think that what you're talking about as far as cognition, in my mind, that seems broader. That's a, a difference in thinking versus, you know, when you're, give, when you're thinking an IQ test, you're thinking higher or lower. It's, it's kind of not, you know, um, different types necessarily of reasoning. It's this one type of thing. What, what other things um, in addition to culture might be um, influencing either, yeah, cognition as a whole or an IQ test um, that a school psychologist might be giving? Well, I think our culture 
puts way too much emphasis on IQ kinds of skills. I mean, they're important. The more you got, the better. There's no doubt about that. But intelligence is much broader than that. There's a, an interesting, <laughs> Donald Trump, when he was running for president in 2016, um, said, someone said, well, you don't know much about the way government works. How's that going to, he said, oh, I have a giant brain. Uh, I don't have to know that. I, I can think. Yeah, and I think that's a, a very common attitude. If you're very smart, you can figure things out. And the truth is, knowledge has a lot more to do with being able to reason well about the world than sort of the pure smarts that you get on the IQ test. IQ tests have problems that are very different from the kinds of things that we encounter in everyday life. I mean, um, the materials tend to be abstract. They tend to be not very interesting. You try to, as much as possible, pull concepts out of their context, uh, which is an unnatural way of thinking, not just for the Chinese, but for everybody. Um, and uh, so actually I'm, I'm writing a book now <laughs> where I'm talking, it's, I'm, I'm, it's a sort of an attack on the overemphasis on IQ and saying what, what some of the other kinds of things are that are important. Creativity, and they, all of these things I'll mention are measurable. They're correlated with IQ, but they're not the same thing as IQ. And they predict a success in school and success in occupations completely independently of the IQ score that somebody has. Um, one is creativity. People differ in their generation of ideas. Uh, some people just, my, my dear friend and colleague, Lee Ross, basically, I think he clocked about four or five ideas per sentence uh, the whole time I knew him. I mean, he's just constantly generating ideas and, and some people just do that. And it's only partially related to IQ. Um, and um, uh, uh, the um, curiosity is another thing. I, I'm, I, I actually can never, I know some people with IQs that are way higher than mine, and they're not very curious about the world. I mean, and I, I don't comprehend that. I mean, to me, part of intelligence <laughs> is being interested in, in people and the world and events, history, et cetera. And I know people, they, they can blast through IQ tests and they're, they're, and they're not, uh, they're just not very curious. Well, you're not going to be a good scientist if you're not curious, that's for sure. And there are a lot of things, I think, that uh, the more curiosity you have, the better job you will do. I think it's most true of most, most jobs. Uh, so there's uh, creativity and curiosity. And then there's ability to reason pragmatically. Um, I, mean, I know people with sky-high IQs <laughs> who have to be shown how to get across the street. I mean, it's just, uh, when you teach very, very smart students, like I have, I've taught at Yale and University of Michigan, and these are really, really high IQ people. Uh, but the, it's just not that, among, among this high IQ group of people, it's not the ones with the highest IQ who are the best scientists by any means. It's those who are be best at pragmatic reasoning. If you give a problem to a student, uh, say, you know, please solve this problem, uh, and uh, uh, will the student be able to figure out what to do, how to make it work, and so on. And that, that, those, those, that set of tools are just quite different. But then aside from that, there's knowledge, which is, you know, what Donald Trump thought was irrelevant because his giant brain would allow him to help the to, to, to see any problems and how to solve them. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a bias that I think it's, it's shot through our society. I mean, that, that what really, really counts uh, is IQ. I, here's the thing, people, I'm sure you've known people who, who you think might benefit from therapy and you say, you know, you really, you might think about doing that. He says, well, you know, I'm much smarter than any therapist. So, oh, okay, so what? <laughs> I mean, you're probably smarter than your dentist and your auto repairman as well. But you, when you, know, when you, when you have a tooth problem, you go to a dentist because of the knowledge that, that's there. 
Uh, and uh, so then that allows me to talk about another aspect of all of this. Oh, let me, let me give, <laughs> uh, I, I'm collecting people uh, who, though have, who, though they have extremely high IQs, are not nearly as effective in the world as people with much lower IQs. And one of my other favorite examples uh, of this is Hillary Clinton. When Clinton was in law school, uh, she had a, uh, it was a fellow uh, uh, law student named uh, Ryan, who was ultimately Bill's Secretary of Labor. And he said, whenever a question was asked, uh, Clinton's hand, Hillary's hand went up and her answers were never good. They were always perfect. Uh, and, you know, you, you pay much attention to her, you, realize, you see that super, super high IQ. Yet she managed to run two very bad presidential campaigns. Uh, she completely miscalculated how to deal with the, uh, what might have been uh, universal health care if she had handled it differently. In that case, it was just a question. She thought, oh, she and, and her uh, and uh, Tipper Gore could solve this problem and with talking with experts. And this reminds me, while we're still in politicians, uh, when uh, Kennedy was elected president, his vice president, of course, was Lyndon Johnson. And a very good friend of Lyndon Johnson was the Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. And um, uh, Johnson said, oh, my God, these people he's got in the cabinet, it's just incredible. I mean, they're Nobel Prize winners, they're Harvard graduates here, Stanford graduates there. L Rayburn listened to all this and says, yeah, OK, that's great. Uh, but I wish one of them had run for sheriff once. <laughs> the kind of knowledge that you can get from that activity that you're not going to get by being a super smart economist or historian from Harvard. So um, anyway, so uh, it's, it's fun to do that. They, actually, the person, <laughs> I've got to get on to other things that will interest your readers here, but I would say the highest IQ person I ever met, I mean, a tested IQ that I didn't think people could have of 184, okay? This guy got a PhD at the University of Chicago at a time when Chicago was really regarded as the best university in the world. And he was trained as a political scientist and philosopher. He only managed to have three jobs in his career at very un undistinguished places that you never heard of. Uh, and that was just because he was kind of socially blind. I mean, he would he just... He couldn't have a discussion with people without sort of getting irritated and trying to show how smart he was. Uh, so all of those, those anecdotes are to, to the point that IQ ain't the whole ball game by, by any means in any endeavor in life. Um, the other thing that I've focused on is some of these things that get taught in school. Uh, and they're great. I mean, statistics and probability now are taught to most people. I think they ought to be in the, uh, in the curriculum in the high schools early uh, because the, the aspects of probability and statistics that interest me that, and because they help us to solve real life problems are extremely easy to understand. In fact, many of them we actually have intuitive notions about, or we have uh, learned how to apply them in some domain where we're, where we're expert. People are very good at thinking probabilistically in domains where they're expert. Uh, they have to be because, uh, for example, you have to understand how much evidence you need for a given proposition. Uh, and that's the law of large numbers, which basically says the more evidence, the better. But it's more precise than that. And people actually have a good intuitive understanding of this in, in, in domains where they're at all expert. Um, so 
if you say you know, there's a coach who's uh, a college football coach and he goes to look at high school students play football uh, and he's got fantastic recommendations for the from this one kid, his coaches say he's just absolutely fabulous. The people who opposed him but on opposing teams say how terrific he is. But um, the coach watches the guy for a little while. He misthrows the ball a couple of times. He makes a couple of unforced errors. He's just not terribly impressive. Um, do you think he would be wise to not recruit this guy? Do you think maybe he should recruit the guy anyway? People who are knowledgeable about football said, for God's sake, he had a bad day. day. I mean, of all these other people saying he's that damn good, he's good. <clears throat> people who don't know sports won't give you that excellent answer. If they know drama, however, if they're actors in high school or college, great recommendations for this actress. She's just fantastic. Such soul, such conviction, such clear concept. And so you watch the uh, 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 an, uh, an audition, uh, and she's in a sort of doesn't shine, doesn't have quite the right. Uh, diction uh, for the role, so on. You know, should you cast this person in a good role in the play that you're doing, or should you say, no, uh, it's, uh, I just didn't like what I saw? People who, who've done a fair amount of acting say, oh, for God's sake, I mean, everybody can screw up an audition. Uh, my daughter was an opera singer, and she said, performance and uh, tryouts, auditions, uh, require different skills. So she says, I'm sure she's right. I don't exactly know what that means or what they would be, but I'm sure she's right about that. Um, so at any rate, uh, teach probability and statistics and actually spend the time to work through everyday life situations the way I just did here. You do that a little bit and people get the point. They understand how, how the law of large numbers dictates uh, how much evidence they ought to have in relation to how variable they assume is the thing they're trying to think about. That football playing ability is highly variable. Acting audition, I gather, <laughs> is highly variable. Uh, and... Uh, so you need more evidence. Uh, well, can, can you teach this stuff? I mean, you certainly do, can teach it in college. I, I, I used to study the errors of re in reasoning that people made because they didn't understand how to approach it probabilistically or statistically or from the standpoint of scientific design, design of scientific exper experiments. Um, and... Uh, I said, you know, not only are we stupid, but you can't make us any smarter. I mean, it's just, and uh, I, so I decided I'm going to show that you, you can't really teach this stuff. So I look, gave University of Michigan freshmen, first day of class, problems like this. Um, uh, Dorothy is a manufacturer's representative and she loves her job. Uh, uh, and take because she likes to travel and she's uh, something of a foodie. So whenever she goes to a new city, she tries to go to a city to a, as many of the best recommended restaurants that she can. But she finds that when she gets a really terrific meal at a restaurant, she's typically disappointed when she uh, goes back. Uh, food just isn't as impressive as the first time. Why do you suppose that is? A freshman will never give you a statistical answer to that question. They'll say, well, you know, the, the chef is maybe different or maybe her expectations were too high and so on. And no, 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 no. I mean, it's a simple matter of regression. Extreme events are not likely to be as extreme when they're sampled again. That's just a statistical probabilistic fact. So freshmen will never get to be, as, as seniors, they're vastly more like, several times more likely to give you a, a sensible statistical answer. And the same was true for probabilities and cost-benefit analysis. 
and all kinds of so it's, it's being taught in college, but it ought to be taught in high school, this kind of stuff. And in any case, even in college, you need to give people real world examples. I don't think it takes many for some of the most important inferential principles. I don't think it takes many examples, but you have to give some so, you know, so people can say they can see that it can work for more than, you know, IQ tests or agricultural plots and so on. That reminds me a lot. Of, we've had um, guests on that talk about, so sometimes when we as school psychologists are giving IQ tests, we get all these different numbers. We get this overall IQ number, but you also get a score for you know, perceptual reasoning and visual spatial and, and all these different scores. And we calculate base rates based on if one score is higher than another, how likely is that within the population to be going on? But what we don't often think about, we've had guests kind of bring this up, is the probability of having one like high score or one really low score. And so when you're looking at all those different scores, the probability of having some weakness here or a weakness there, like that's very common within the population about, you know, half the population is going to have some sort of a, a significant weakness. But we as school psychologists, we say, oh my goodness, look at this weakness, this working memory. This is why the child is struggling. I figured it out and, and not thinking about that. That, that frequency of, of what we would expect within the normal population. We've also talked about, you know, figuring out um, learning disability or not learning disability. I know that some people have done studies, you know, to ask school psychologists, what do you think is the likelihood of this child having a learning disability? And they kind of start off at 50-50, like, oh, because it could be this or it could be that, that. But when you think about the frequency of a learning disability within the general population, that kind of baseline of reasoning should be much lower because half the population doesn't have a learning disability, but we think we're making a yes or no kind of decision and has to be 50-50. But yeah, we don't think in terms of these, these statistics that you're talking about. And so I can see how that would be beneficial to actually you know, teach that to high school students. Right. I was surprised. I actually tested medical students at the beginning of medical school and at the end of two years uh, on some of these real world problems that require statistical or scientific reasoning uh, uh, about them. And, uh, and to my, chemists learn nothing about this stuff. Two years of graduate school in chemistry. Lawyers learn nothing. Doctors learn a, f a fair amount. I know, what? That was not my stereotype. So I went and uh, spent some time in a medical decision-making class and it, the mystery completely disappeared. I mean, they're, they're, they're saying, okay, this is, they're doing cost benefit stuff. Are you going to give this high, highly expensive drug to this person who may, who's not quite unlikely to have this particular disease and so on. They're doing uh, statistical uh, kinds of things. And one thing that comes close to your example that I really love is if he says, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that go, that's, that's a good rule for all kinds of things in life. I mean, to, to, be, to look, look at the base rate, what's the likelihood? You know. <clears throat> um, so uh, something else about your example I wanted to, oh yeah, the subtests on IQ tests. Uh, it turns out the higher the IQ of someone, the more jagged the profile. Uh, so, uh, so you get people who are absolutely spectacular at some things and just, you know, so bad at other things. It's, it's, you can hardly believe it. Uh, so the higher the IQ, the more jagged the profile, the more likely it is you're going to find people doing stuff that, what? I mean, how can they do? They're so smart. I mean, that, that's not that hard a thing, but it is for them. I mean, because of the, the uh, IQ isn't a single thing. It's a basket of things. Yeah, I love what you're saying. And it, it makes me think too about, you know, as school psychologists, we are so kind of focused on IQ in terms of, uh, you know, a data point that we need in order to make decisions. But I wonder about, in your research, you, you talk about the variables that impact IQ and, and the difference, the, or maybe I should say, the lack of difference in after you get to a certain sort of range that 
um, increased IQ points makes for a person. And, and I also found it really interesting when you uh, talk about the theories that have been proposed about um, biological and genetic impact on IQ. Can you talk a little bit about that and tell us kind of what the, where the research started, wh where it is now, and, and what we know about what impacts IQ? All right. Well, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, the intelligence game and the uh, and the IQ game, which were considered to be the same thing, basically, a hundred years ago, uh, they figured out that uh, its IQ is mostly genetically determined. Uh, that uh, school doesn't make much difference. Early home life is not all that important. And it's unbelievable, but for 70 or 80 years, that's what people thought, <laughs> and it's all wrong. I mean, the genetic contribution, first of all, and this is extremely interesting for, for, I would think, for a school, school psychologist to know, is that uh, the genetic contribution to IQ for upper middle class people is very high. 80% of the variance in IQ in an upper middle class population is due to genes. But in the bottom uh, of, the, of the society, the lowest socioeconomic status, genes count for nothing. They make, there is no contribution to the, to the variation in that population. Now we don't know exactly why that is, but I, I have some opinions about it. I mean, Upper middle class families are like Tolstoy's happy families. I mean, they're all alike with respect to cognitive training. They're all doing the right things. They're having conversations with their kids. They're doing interesting things with them. They're reading them, they're taking them on trips, and et cetera. They're doing all the right things. There's just not much difference, cognitively speaking, between Dr. Smith's family and Dr. Jones's and lawyer Jones's uh, family. But for in the for lower socioeconomic stratum, uh, there are some families that are as uh, well equipped for producing smart kids as any upper middle class family would be. And others are chaotic and disruptive in every sense. So when you have this huge environmental variation, that's what's gonna be driving the bus. And in fact, if a kid has a very high IQ, you know, a potential IQ, if he's in a bad enough environment, he's never going to, it's like a kid can have great basketball talent, you know, lying in there in his brain and his body. But if he never gets on a basketball court, he's never going to be any good. And it's the same way with, um, uh, with early childhood education uh, in the home. Uh, and... Um, and school is crucial for being, you can't have a high IQ, let alone be smart generally without school. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a class with 30 kids, you know, in a building with water fountains. It can be, you know, just, it can be at home or something, but it's gotta be the equivalent of school. Um, one guy did a study of African kids who were like eight or nine or 10 years old, they'd never been to school. And he gave them an allegedly culture-free IQ test and they did terribly on it. So three or four months later, he gave them the same test and they had increased their IQ by 12 points <laughs> in three months. Uh, it's because, I mean, school teaches things that we don't realize that, that they're teaching. They teach counterfactual reasoning. Uh, they teach uh, logic. I mean, just the, the, the abstract. There are wonderful examples of, of, of psychologists giving various kinds of tests to people with uh, no formal training. And they seem comical to us. There's a Russian psychologist who uh, looked at um, uh, peasants who had Russian peasants who had never been to school. And he would say something like, uh, as you may know, uh, in the North, bears are white. You know, I have a friend, he sent me a letter recently and he said he had just seen a bear. He lives in the North. 
what color do you suppose the bear was? How should I know? Ask your friend who saw the bear. <laughs> They're unable to simple, you know, all A's are B. Uh, uh, C is an A, is it a B? That just, you, over and over again, you're getting stuff like that in schools and it becomes, it goes into your spinal cord, you know, what's called modus ponens, the logical construction. Uh, so, but it's this way with all kinds of things it, that, that we, we don't, school is doing much, much more for our intellects than most people realize. Um, and um, so, anyway, so where was I? So uh, back to, get me back on track or get me a new track. This is great. We're sort of chatting how, like, just fascinating listening to you talk about all this. And and I think it really does apply to, uh, there, there's a good chat going on, on on YouTube about what we're trying to measure when we're testing kids. What is it we're actually looking for? And, um, and uh, you know, some of these tests are constructed, you know, as you mentioned, just uh, testing the, the kids in Africa with, uh, you know, supposedly culture-free tests, right? Um, you know, we, we have children from all over the world in, in a lot of our schools. And if we're assessing them with an IQ test that was standardized on American children who are English dominant with, you know, reared in a household uh, where is, is uh, the uh, primary language and we're measuring American thinking, you know, influenced by our language and um, we're not really measuring that child's abilities in a lot of ways. So uh, just thinking about how our tests are constructed and what we're trying to really look for. Um, so I, I love the idea of curiosity and um, pragmatics and um, creativity as uh, having great influence. And these are things that we can look for as well with our kids. So right. I don't know if these things are trainable at all. Uh, I think how to be creative within a discipline that you're learning, that's teachable, I'm, I would think. Um, I mean, I've, I've noticed that people, scientists tend to be uh, as good at best as their advisor in graduate school was. So they're teaching things, a good advisor is teaching things that it's not obvious. I mean, Europe, there's an amazing fact that, uh, that in the 20s and 30s, German psychology was light years ahead of everybody else's, including American. Uh, as of the end of World War II, there was no good German psychology and it was two generations before you begin to get first rate German psychology. I mean, it's, you know, you think you can read, read the books, read the articles. No, that's not going to do it. You, 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 you have to, you have to work with a creative scientist side by side and see how he's handling or she the problems. If in the absence of that, uh, you know, which doesn't seem like it should be so tremendously important, uh, but it is. So there's a great book by. Uh, uh, a scientist and philosopher of science named Michael Polanyi called Tacit Knowledge. Uh, and it's about the things that we know that we don't realize that we know and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the things that other people do know e explicitly or tacitly and the explicit stuff they can teach us, but the, he talks about people getting a, a machine, a complicated machine delivered to them and they can't make it work. They look at the manual, they cannot make the thing work. You have to have a company representative come and say, oh, oh, you have to push this thing down and pull that thing up and then it'll work. That's tacit knowledge to him. It doesn't even get into the list of instructions. Uh, but, um, for me, that's particularly salient because I can never make anything work uh, from instruction or from exploration. I just, uh, <clears throat> I was not meant for the world of devices. 
that we know. <laughs> I mean, well, however high my IQ is, let me tell you, that is, th that is in the basement. I mean, uh, this became clear to me first when I'm trying to build models when I was a kid, and there were always pieces left out when I got through <laughs> things that didn't uh, look like they were supposed to look like. I mean, that's, that's your mechanical ability. I mean, that's, that's huge, substantially genetically in influenced, for sure, but it's also highly teachable, I think, for other people. I'm not sure about me. We have a, a viewer question that I wanted to insert um, before we move on from this. Um, John asks, did the German culture of easy racism overwhelm the learned, th the learned thinking of science-based German psychologists? Well, a big part of the problem was a, 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 a very large fraction of the best German science was done by Jews. So they get rid of all the Jews, either from death or, or immigration, uh, and they've, they've enormously damaged their scientific establishment. But it would have, you know, they would have gone on to do, continue to go. There are very few, I don't know if, I know of very few social scientists in my 55 year career who are racists. I mean, it's, uh, there, are, there are not even that many um, physical scientists I've known that I would ever have suspected of that. Mm -hmm. uh, although early on, a lot of those I, IQ people, they, a lot of them, they were racists. A lot of them were. Oh. I'm reminded, um, just as you were talking about sort of logic and some of the, the fallacies in reasoning, um, uh, and, you, and you mentioned medicine, I, I think we've had a little bit of a push in psychology to sort of adopt some of that evidence-based medical approach, which looks at Bayesian base rates and um, likelihood outcomes. And um, I read some stuff recently by Eric Young, Youngstrom and... Um, um, Scott, the late Scott Lillianfeld, and um, just uh, I'm hoping that we have a push in that direction. Um, you know, I, I think it's needed, especially when we're looking at um, treatment outcomes and um, and educational outcomes, which certainly uh, we're heavily invested in as well. Right, right. There are several uh, looking at this this lower class population. There are several things you can do that make uh, an amazing difference. I don't know if you folks are familiar with um, the uh, the very best uh, early childhood uh, education done by uh, the Abbasidarian group and the Perry School uh, group in in uh, Ypsilanti, and they were they were very much, it was, it was with lower class black kids. Um, and uh, there was hope that this experience would result in higher IQs. And it did at first, but uh, they tended to tail, tail off uh, in, by mid elementary school. Of course, most of them were going to very poor elementary school, so they weren't keeping up with the momentum that they'd had. Uh, but, and then by, ad by adolescence, there was not much left at all on the IQ front. So people thought, well, in a way, a lot of effort went into that, but it wasn't all that successful. Uh, it turns out, if you look at those kids 30 years later after that, the, the gains in uh, uh, social um, uh, factors are, are, are absolutely, and, and educational as well they're like 50% more likely to graduate from high school, 25% more likely to go to college, half as likely to be ever imprisoned in their life. I mean, it's just absolutely massive effects of this stuff. And no, no particular higher IQ in life. I mean, which but is another way, by the way, of pointing out the limited importance of IQ. These kids, are, they've learned a lot of stuff that's a, allowed them to, to uh, navigate life quite well without having the kinds of skills that, that will, you'll make you do well on IQ tests. Um, there are things that you can do 
if, if you get from a lower class, you know, underclass uh, women who've just had a kid, they haven't got a clue what a kid is and how to deal with it. You can just, there are programs that go into the home and say, you know, if the kid does this, this is what you should do. And if he does that, that's what he wants, et cetera. And these effects are, are quite measurable. I mean, you're mentioning, you know, measurable uh, evidence-based education. So, and these things have been measured and the, 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 the consequences are, are huge. I mean, it's not all that, and there's a lot of stuff to parenthood that, uh, that people don't intuitively know, but that they can be taught, it turns out. Um, so um, at every stage, it's, you know, there's, there's ways to, to compensate. I should say, going back to this <coughs> uh, contribution of genes to IQ, that looks like it may be especially true or even only true uh, in the US that lower class uh, kids, um, uh, the, the, there's a big genetic, uh, if there's a, a, a zero genetic effect uh, on the differences among lower class kids. But in Europe and uh, especially in the Scandinavian countries, this is not true. There's a very substantial genetic uh, contribution to differences in the lower class population. And we don't know why that is, but you can bet, I bet my bottom dollar that it's because of the social support, uh, the, the welfare net that you have in those Scandinavian countries. They just don't let people be in terrible situations uh, with no money and no food and no, they just don't let it happen. And if you, if you do that, uh, you, know, you you can get kids rising to their potential. So, and it's, it's, it's a very, I think it's a very unfortunate commentary on the US, how far away we are from that situation. Absolutely. Um, I want to squeeze in. I want to be so respectful of your time, but we could listen to you all evening. But we want to squeeze in just one more viewer question, um, which reminds me of your memoir. And I, I need to recommend your memoir, Thinking, to everybody out there who's listening and watching, because it is a wonderful read. It is a memoir and a travel through the history of social psychology and um, and specific um, discussions of research. It's, it's really wonderful, so I recommend it. But our viewer question is that um, uh, someone is curious about your definition or explanation of executive function. Do we know what we're measuring when we're talking about executive function? Well, I'm a little bit out of my element on that. Uh, my understanding is that... Um, it has to do, it, it seems to me, the prefrontal cortex is where people say that, that's where they placed <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of reasoning that, that, uh, that's characteristic of that part of the brain. It has to do with uh, formulating problems, formulating a strategy of dealing with the problems, the ability to follow uh, steps, one step following from another uh, in an effective way. Um, and uh, so um, I'm, not, I'm not terribly knowledgeable of, uh, about the, certainly I'm not knowledgeable about the biology of it, but I'm, I'm not even all, all that knowledgeable about the kinds of things that it mediates, um, except that it seems pretty clear that uh, judgment in everyday life uh, is high, highly mediated by uh, the prefrontal cortex. All right, I'm looking for last minute questions and comments. Um, and I, I think we, we did everything, but this has been awesome. And so uh, we were talking in the chat that we could just listen to you all night long um, with all the examples and, and you know, um, it's been great. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I've, obviously I had a good time. <laughs> We're glad.
Um, and then I want to remind everybody our next episode is going to be January 2nd with Ahmad Zahir um, to talk again about ACT, um, who was awesome. We've had him on before. And so I'd love for anybody to check him out. But Rebecca or Eric, any last thoughts, um, comments, questions? Uh, so appreciate your time, Dr. Nisbet. And uh, as Rebecca said, yes, go read the book, um, Thinking and uh, we look forward to catching you on one of your Coursera courses and, and uh, whenever we get a chance to talk again. This is wonderful. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much. And I also want to just plug the Coursera Cap course for even for school psychologists. It's a really wonderful just um, journey through uh, critical thinking. And it made me think recently at a dentist appointment that what the dentist was actually ask, asking me to do was some A-B testing to discover whether I really had a tooth issue or not. So that's just a little teaser for the Coursera class. Please take it. It's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Nisbet. Thank you so much for your time. I have to mention that, yeah.